Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and a very happy, if a bit tired and emotional, Benjamin Kayser. And it's a big one this week as well. Not only will we delve deep into what it took for France to win a first Six Nations title and Grand Slam for 12 long years, we'll also be joined by one of the Grand Slam heroes themselves and a pretty important one at that. We'll get him on shortly and find out all about what it's been like being part of this France side and whether the party's still going on. But you were there as well, Benji, pitch side, Saturday night, Paris. How was it? Ah, uh, boys, it was one of those precious, precious moments where we called it work, but I was just an extra fan. I was the 79th, 177th spectator, <laughs> probably, you know, just standing there and clapping. Um, I've got a good story for you. I was sitting, I was pitch side to ITV, and so I was sitting actually next to the, to the bench. I was sitting next to Joe Marder basically for the first half. And he, he had to grab me at some point. He's like, mate, if you keep on hitting me, I'm going to chin you. Because <laughs> every time something was happening, he was getting elbowed and pushed and shaking about. And <laughs> I was on the floor. Man. Every, every scrum I was hitting, I say, hey, see, I told you, whatever. So it was funny, funny, funny. He's like, mate, I, I think we're going to have to sort it out if you keep on pushing me up with it. Um, <laughs> Why are we on the England bench, Ben? Do you were a spy? I, I think I would, mate, I'll tell you what. I I beat England by actually stealing them some protein bars that they had because I was thinking if some guy's going to need a little bit of boost of energy and he doesn't have his protein bar, that's me, boys. That's me. Uh, I was very proud. No, um, this is an incredible moment. Incredible, incredible moment. I think they put a lot of emphasis on on the show, which made it extra special. They put a lot of emphasis, the boys, on how much they want to pay back to to, to the clubs and to the main asset of French rugby, which is his clubs, his volunteers and all that. Um, and, and you could really see it. I mean, they picked up, I could speak about it for days, but Bernard Laporte, I saw him, he called Didier Lacroix, which is the president of Toulouse and got him to lift the trophy with them. That's unheard of. <laughs> Never going to happen again. Um, then they went to the stand straight away. They celebrated the fans 650 times. I thought, I don't know, you saw that thing where they're dancing all together and they're, and they're going to... Uh, one after the other, they keep on dancing with the trophy, and then they did that um, "Free from Desires," you know, sort of uh, singing. They still don't That's... know the words too, but it's amazing. Nah. <laughs> it's it's very very genuine though. It's really yep. them. They're a great bunch of boys. They're a great great bunch of boys who thoroughly deserve um, their 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 accolade. And and I mean, everybody loves them this week. Everybody's gonna hate them from next week because they're gonna become targets. But not the best game. Actually, technically, a lot of a lot of mistakes, both sides, but who cares? An incredible, incredible moment. Eighty thousand people on their feet, an electric uh, atmosphere like I've never really felt uh, twice like that, um, and just a special, special moment. So, huge weight off their shoulders, um, and a great bunch of boys. And I'm and I'm sure, and I know actually because I got some videos and stuff, but I know that they they properly. They probably enjoyed their Sunday. I know some of them were still enjoying it yesterday morning or the Monday morning, um, but it's well-deserved because bloody hell did they work hard and did they do us proud. And Johnny, you're so often in Paris for these big games, but Dublin at the weekend for you. So were you watching <laughs> Benji Pitside jealous <laughs> like everyone else? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I've been really lucky to have been there over the past 24 months and seen the evolution like everyone else. Um, so yeah, a little bit of jealousy not being over there. Um, I was with ITV um, over in Dublin for the Scotland-Ireland game, but I think like everybody, and again, I managed to debrief the game a little bit with Sean Edwards on the plane to Perpignan together on, on Sunday, um, just how much fun they have together, like how much they love each other, the feel good, the celebrations after every game. It's not just that game, like they work hard, they play hard. It's a real weird cliche, but they absolutely love it. They have the time of their lives. That's what Sean was saying. They absolutely love each other and they're and having they're the best... To. Well, yeah, they're allowed to, as certain other sites that we'll maybe get onto later aren't. Um, but that's it. They're having the time of their lives. You can see the smiles on their faces, the tears of Antoine Dupont at the end of the game. You know, tears of joy. That's how much it means to them, um, this crop of players. So, yeah, incredibly privileged to have been there over the past 24 months. But, yeah, a little bit jealous that I didn't get to be there uh, for a few reasons in Paris over the weekend. It would have been very cool to have been part of the, the weekend in Paris. We'll get the inside scoop shortly, which is what we all want to hear. But... Before we get there, Benji, you mentioned it, the atmosphere. You've played a lot of the Stade de France. You've been there a lot in the media. Did it feel different Saturday? 100%. Like, without a shadow of a doubt, it was the best atmosphere I've been part of. 
uh, in South, even better than New Zealand. And I thought we picked against New Zealand in November. It really was that bit extra special. Again, maybe down to uh, organization sort of effects, not just the buzzing of, of the crowd, but also the effort that they put, the presentation of the team, the celebration with the fireworks at the end. It was a proper show and everybody was there feeling electric. They played with the lights, you know, before they came. I, I thought it was outstanding. It really was. Uh, if anything, if they keep those standards up, whether it's for France or other teams, it just makes me think that the World Cup 2023 is going to be unreal. Um, it, it was special. The, in terms of energy from the crowd, the first 40 minutes were, were out of this world. The 40th to 65 were very, very quiet because they were getting very, very heavy. You could feel the tension. You could taste it. It was unreal. Um, you really could tell that everybody was, yeah, uh, ooh, you know, didn't really know what to say. Uh, there was no um, animosity from the crowds. You know, it's not like they were booing um, people and all that. But you could tell that people could barely sort of breathe. And that towards that 78th minute and 35 seconds, like 12 points. Yeah, okay, we can start to loosen up just a tiny bit. But did it that was transmit the, to the players, do you think? Did that, I think did they 100%. Feel that? Yeah. yeah, well... Maybe not. Maybe it's not because the crowd was feeling like that that they felt it, but everybody was on the same boat. Um, England were doing well in the second half. They were really pushing holes. Um, we, we talk about a few missed mistakes in the first half, especially for the French uh, French team. Remember Damien Pono being set up beautifully by Gael Ficou, but he drops it. He's got a boulevard in front of him uh, in a couple of, of missed occasions. But Joe Martian has got the same in the, second, in the second half, and they were really starting to scare us. Uh, I think England, you know, conceded a couple of turnovers, made a couple of mistakes, didn't seize many opportunities that would have made the game even uh, even tighter and even more stressful. So you could definitely tell that there was a lot of pressure, but they still managed to get through it, which is another learning uh, opportunity, which is another way of saying, we can be extraordinary against New Zealand. We can also learn how to win in the shits in, in Wales. We can learn how to still perform and rock and be all the way up there against Ireland. We can do the hard stuff against Italy and against Scot Scotland when needed. Uh, but, you know, we know that if if Stuart Hall catches it before halftime today from ballgame, you know, so they, they just learn. They just learn. And against England, it was a big old side that doesn't create enough uh, or as much as Ireland, definitely not. But it's a big old unit side with Ellis Gensch, who was the baby rhino throwing himself from the backfield. So I said to you, there was Joe Marley. And then Ellis just came and said, sat down next to me afterwards. I asked him, he was like, how much does Eddie Jones ask of you? He's like, mate, he's like, it's hard enough to push against Winnie Antonio. Then I've got, I've got to carry the balls from the backfield. But no, it's a, it was a proper game. But France went, got through it in, in a very smart, mature, uh, experience way, uh, which I, I really, really enjoy. That that one for me is the key learning from from last night for Saturday night. And see on that Ellis Genge point, surely you were sat next to Joe Marler being like, mate, are they asking you to do this as well? Because I was thinking, <laughs> as soon as he carried the first one, I was like, might be an anomaly. Right now it's actually a tactic on number two. I'm like, how is he going to scrummage after this? That's impossible. How is he going to do this? He still did well, to be fair. Really I was, well. I was, I was blown away by how much work those front wars go get through. The best, the most offloads in the whole Six Nations is Cyril Bay. <laughs> He's only your lucid prop. Julien Marchand had a monster of a game. Winnie Antonio had an average game against Wales, had a proper game against England for the first 50. did really well. I was, Jamie George for me, a solid. Ellis Genji is out of this world. And I was surprised they picked Will Stewart, or is it Will? I can't remember, but Stewart from Bath. Bloody hell, he did well. Mm -hmm. And he moved around and stuff. I mean, the amount of work, and you think about Tyke Furlong and stuff, the amount of work that those front rowers get through now is 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 unreal. Um, so, no, very, very impressed. And Gench was returning the kicks for England, Johnny, but we spoke about it last week. It was a clear strategy. The team England picked a lot yep. of contestable kicks. Um, they did outkick France in terms of the number of kicks, but France still seemed to win that kicking battle, didn't they? Yeah, it was the type as well. So Jaminet actually stood up um, really well. Again, he came under a bit of criticism. He said he was ready for it, practiced all week. Um, Freddie Stewart again came through, competed in there, did really well, pinched one or two. But it's weird, as soon as it became scrappy in any sense, and again, this is going back to conversation with Sean Edwards, he was like, the amount of jacklers we've got on that field, if anything loose hits the deck and people don't time their clears ready, we win the ball back. And that was it. England did really well in the contest, a clear strategy, but the amount of times... In Y channels, Fiku, Dante, Villiers from scraps win the ball back from nothing. Um, so again, it's just so hard. I mean, the tactic is right, but you then have to 
contest, win the ball and get their numbers to make sure you get the ball back. Otherwise, they can lose a contest and win, win the ball straight back off you. So, look, it was really impressive. It was probably the right strategy by England. It was weird from first, way, first phase and from launch, we've seen France actually blitz in defence. This time they didn't. So England almost played into their hands and, and just sort of, you know, little passes into the midfield trying to go over the game line because they were scared to go out wide. And it allowed France not blitzing off first phase to refine their shape, come much and, and blitz again second, third phase. So again, really smart. Benji talked about the evolution, finding different ways to win. Defensively, again, now they're toying with opposition. We, we blitz this game. We don't this game. We can manage it. So really hard to play against. And that's been the key element for me of this French side is they've just been so hard to play against every single week for every different kind of opposition, be it New Zealand, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, they've blitzed people off the field. Um, and we talk often about a Brad affair or a, what do you call a Brad affair in English? An arm wrestle, jeez, an arm wrestle. Um, and now France in an arm wrestle, they've just got quality, whether it's aerial, whether it's on the deck, whether it's jackling defensively, set piece, the launch. I mean, some of the quality, talk about that phase of play to put, um, Penno through a gap and, and again Fiku again through a gap balls went down but the quality they have and able to unlock teams in attack as well um, was just sensational so again maybe not their best performance but able to win and at a canter um, it was some performance and the key is as well Benji they don't need many chances do they the clinical I think they only had about five visits to England's 22 three tries they take their chances yeah they took their chances they they still dominated at least the discipline at first not so much discipline in terms of um, ball handling ability. They still made a lot of mistakes, but purely kickable penalties. They they were they were they were better than England. I think the stats are really random. If if you look at the game and then you look at them after, I just couldn't comprehend most. I think England did like 150 passes and 105 against uh, uh, for France. Uh, England made more meters with the ball, just a little bit more, but still, uh, definitely territory possession was was for England. So it, it's. It, it, it's a bit random to, to see it like that, like that because I didn't think France were on the back foot. But like Johnny said, defense so well that actually the defense sort of becomes an attack in a way. Yeah. So um, so so that, that's why it was both teams ha having a go at it. No, I just thought pay, uh, choices paid off. Antoine Dupont has stepped up to the plate of being a charismatic and unreal leader to the point of handling his emotions individually and releasing them exactly at the right time, like Johnny said when he, he, he shed that tear. Um Julien Marchand, don't forget, was away from the New Zealand game. And Piato Mavaka uh, did incredibly well. And they still appointed him. You know, they've got faith in him. They put him there. I think he's delivered times 100. Gabin Villiers is not the most out-of-this-world easy pick originally, before the Six Nations, because he's a different profile, right? There's Teddy Thomas, who's lightning quick. There's whatever, other, other, other players. Bloody hell, did he give back? He's just unreal. He you really you know that there's some strong choices that just keep on delivering one after the other. Come on, Rocky at number four <laughs> is did an outstanding Six Nations. The scrum didn't definitely didn't look weaker with him, dominated opposition and still learned from his mistakes in the line out and delivered one hell of a performance. Um, and and you know, and the list goes on. Jonathan Dante at 12. Poof. I mean, he is he is proper. Um, and, 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 and that's all these guys, uh, six, two on the bench, definitely key again, cause that's a risky move, right? But he actually proven to, to be key. So no, I'm very impressed with the way they did things. Very impressed with how they're still getting better. You're not any step closer winning the world cup after what happened on Saturday, different worlds, different eras, 16 months or 18 months down the line, it's going to be completely different. But I think you've got a bit more confidence into your ability of, actually rising up to the plate and having a plan A, plan B, plan C, which is definitely going to be key considering the opening game against New Zealand. You never know what can happen. You're going to have to have a bit more tools in there. Um, my, uh, without the, the, the technical analysis, I was just proud. Very, very proud. Proud to be French because we put on a proper show. Proud to, to know some of these boys because they're a good bunch of boys. Uh, Gaël Ficou, Julien Marchand, Damien Pono, and some after the game. I, I was... Like I could have been emotional if they let me, if they let me, but um, it's, it, I was just genuinely very happy and very proud for them. What um, were they saying? Were they saying, Ben, you don't get emotional. You'll get me going. No, <laughs> one of them, one of them called me Mr. Kayser. I felt like I was 65 years old, <laughs> oh. but um, oh, no, no, man. It, it was just, they're just, they're just good kids. And I call them kids. With, you call with, them kids. You are with 65. A lot, with a lot, with a lot of respect and, and, and love, but like, they're, they're just, they're just, they're just good. They're nice. I think they they genuinely love each other. 
they genuinely love what they represent uh, and then they're going to go uh, onwards and upwards. Who called you Mr. Kaiser? I can't tell you because I chinned him straight after. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnny, it seems like ancient history now, um, but we should mention briefly the Jack Noll incident. Mate, it's a red card every single day. Um, yeah, oh, so mate, again, again, kick chase. He's not looking at Jaminet. He's not in control of his body. I mean, the referee actually looks, again, it's, look, it's almost like he's trying to find an excuse not to send him off. So he says, exactly. has, has he changed his line? Has Damien Penel changed his line? On the way? No, he's running no, a straight first, line. First, they were looking at Antoine Dupont's line. And they're like, well, is there anybody else around Exactly. There? What right, about Penel? Like, 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 let's let's like, has he changed his line? Right. And no, he hasn't changed his line. He's run a straight line from his position on the wing back to support his ball carry. What do you want him to do? Run an L line? Do you want him to run along the touch line and then Off come the from... No, you, you can't. And they said, has he run across? And it's that point they've used that change in language. Yes, he's run across the pitch, but it's a straight line to support You're his allowed player. To do that too. Exactly. But the way they've used the language of the TMO is they've used the fact that it was a change in direction, which it wasn't. It was a straight line to chalk it off. So for me, really dangerous. Again, Jamine does really well not to milk it. Another thing, he bounces straight back up, gets on with the game. Fair play to him, but he lands on the back of his neck. Ultra he dangerous. Can, he can really hurt himself. Exactly. So it was a red card. Um, I don't know if they'll review it. I don't know if they'll go back um, and there'll be a sighting commissioner. But they've ruled on field that play on a penalty against Damian Penno as well, which is super harsh. Um, so yeah, I 100 live, and then watching the replays, thought it was a red card for Jack Nowell. The um, the the ref is Frank Murphy, who actually used to play nine with me at Leicester Tigers, and then he then he he went into refing, and I saw him after. And the main ref was Jaco Piper, right? Piper, yeah. And, and so uh, I was. Um, Oh, sorry. And the other one was Mike, the Scottish guy that we had on the pod. Mike? Mike Adamson. Mike Adamson. Adamson, that's it. And I was speaking to him after the game and stuff. And I was like, I was telling Frank Murphy, he's like, tell me if I, if uh, England didn't get a red card after two minutes against Ireland, would you, you looked at it the same way? Oh, you're looking for something different. It's not true. It's unfair, whatever. <laughs> I was like, mate, at least you could maybe go from red to yellow because he doesn't land on his head first. He lands on his back first. Hallelujah, because he, like you said, he could have milked it more. He, he just needs to throw his neck a little bit and he's straight on his head. Uh, but he actually tried to protect himself, fair play to him, and landing on his back. So it could have been yellow and the black. He's like, no, he changes his line. I was like, mate, that is utter bullshit. <laughs> completely, completely wrong call. Um, especially because uh, Jake Noel doesn't even go for the ball. At least, you know, if you get bounced off and you try to jump, but he doesn't even try to jump at all. No. I don't see how they could have been a clearer pitcher than that. Well, that's enough of having you guys talk about the game. Let's hear it from the horse's mouth. Let's find out how Paris really was on and off the field on Saturday night. And we can have a chat with one of the French heroes. Greg Aldrit joins us. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. A bit sad after the game, but uh, recovering well. So it's okay back in La Rochelle now. I bet. Benji sounds tired. I can only imagine what you're feeling. Try and sum up the emotions. How does it feel to be a Grand Slam champion? Well, after the game, uh, thing I didn't realize I was so so exhausted about uh, the eight weeks, uh, all the, the stress, the pressure, and uh, and the game. The final game was uh, tough against uh, England, so I couldn't realize. And I think like more more day after day now, I'm starting to realize all the all the message uh, I've got on my on my phone. Everybody um, congratulating and and to see uh, all the the impact on the on the fan is uh, we start to realize that we did a grand slam. Mate, talk us through the celebrations. How big was the party? What did you get up to? And how is everyone now? <laughs> I don't know what I can say and uh, what I need to, to keep telling. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, we had a fantastic party after it's always difficult because the uh, season is not over. But uh, we, we did a great party and I think we will party again this summer. <laughs> Mate, I, I, want, I want to thank you. I want to thank you because that was one proper Six Nations that put a big smile on everybody's faces. And me and Johnny are just another spectator like everybody else. We're just a big fan of, of this whole team because you guys just seem to love each other so much. But I also want to thank you for something very personal. I played with Damien Puno for three years and I've got blisters on my hands by whacking him behind the head because he is one <laughs> headless chicken, completely <laughs> crazy guy. And I saw a picture where you, you chucked him fully dressed with his suits in a, in a bubble bath in Stade de France. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for doing this. Because if I'd been in that change, I would have loved to do this just to shut him up for once and to, just to get him to go to, to, to do things like he's meant to. So, you know, from, from an old fella to a little bit uh, younger fella, thank you so much. 
Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I think I think this rumor might have started with Damian Peno as well, but you had a party on the barge on the Seine, and I think Damian might have said that he lost the trophy in the river. Then Roman Entomac might have embellished and claimed that Baptiste Couillou dived in trying to rescue it. Have you got any info for us? Is the trophy okay? Yeah, the trophy is okay. That is for sure. But after I've got no idea about this story, I, will, uh, <laughs> I don't know where I was at the moment. But uh, no, I have uh, any uh, any um, idea of what happened with the trophy. But the trophy is fine now, so it's most important. <laughs> The trophy is fine and the party was good. That's all we need to know, guys. That's all. That's that's all that matters. <laughs> Do you um? Just I had a question. I was I was Tim was just asking me because I was lucky enough to be there. Uh, if how good the atmosphere was. Do you actually realize in in the the you because I mean obviously you've been performing with the French team for the last two or three years, but do you realize how good the atmosphere was on, on Saturday? How absolutely electric it was. Like I was fortunate enough to be there for the France New Zealand game, and I thought we peaked. I thought that was the poof. Now that was the biggest atmosphere at Stade de France ever. But this one was even better, especially before the game and for the first 40 minutes and definitely after the game. Do you realize how much the, 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 the stadium was buzzing and was completely, you know, uh, heartly, heart melting for, for you guys? Or were you just so focused on job to do? Let's get those minutes, let's party after. Well, uh, of course, we, uh, we see the change of the Stade de France because uh, when I started uh, three years ago now, uh, we You're were welcome. playing with... You're welcome. With, <laughs> we were we were playing Wales in uh, in Stade de France for my first game on the Friday night. It was I think uh, forty thousand people in the stadium. So um, after after having good results and uh, the fan coming back in the stadium as well, because after one year of COVID, we were almost used to 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 be in empty stadium, no no ambience. But now it's uh, starting back, and as you said. The, the, the All Black game was, uh, for me, the, the first real big game where the Stade de France was on fire. And after the, the Stade de France was on fire for all the tournament, now with Ireland as well, even Italy. Italy, was stadium was almost full. I think 70,000 people, something like this. We, uh, we never saw that. And uh, for us, it's really important as well during the game uh, to hear a few times uh, Marseille. Uh, this was some, something uh, that was not happening before. What was the feeling like on Saturday? Obviously, we talked about the the fireworks and the display and the power that comes from that crowd. But internally, within the team, was there a sense of nerves? Was it a feeling of maybe getting over the line? What was the feeling going into that last game? Or was it just excitement to get, get there and potentially be Grand Slam champions? Yes, lots of excitement. Everybody was looking forward during all the week to, to be on Saturday night. After... Uh... As every game, in fact, we prepare it uh, during all the week to, to when we start the game on the Saturday. We know where we are and we know what we're doing. I mean, all the, the, the mental uh, preparation we did as well, all the, um, about, about the stadium, how will be the stadium. So guys from the communication coming to explain us what they're going to do before the game. So in fact, when you arrive on the Saturday, you know exactly what is going to happen if, for the rugby. Well, for rugby, after on the pitch, uh, you, you never know what, what can happen, but at least you prepare it uh, at the maximum. But all uh, what is happening ar around the rugby, in fact, we know everything. So this is uh, like we're leaving a lot of um, of pressure, in fact. So so we know where we are going, where we are putting our foot. And, um, and after, we just need to be focused on rugby. And uh, we made the focus to on the rugby after during all the week. So to, to kind of forget what uh, what it was um, that the Grand, Grand Slam was uh, was after the game. And Johnny mentioned the the feeling in the dressing room. Just take people inside and give us an idea of who are the the talkers, who are the characters. If you're talking about the build up to a game, who's doing all the talking, getting you pumped up? Who's in charge of the music? Who's leading all that? Uh, well, before the game is always Gail speaking. Gail, Antoine. I'm speaking with the forwards normally when we come back earlier, but they were, they were only like come chatting and everything because for a game like this, everybody is prepared. You don't have to uh, to um, to get the, the 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 player ready. You know, just need to be calm, be focused. We said just need to be uh, on defense, really uh, good defense. Uh, don't be break on the middle. Be compact. Always show that we are a good team, uh, a, a team. Be connected. This kind of stuff. And after, um, 
at the at the at halftime, everybody was was well calm, and uh, I think Francois crossed try as well just before the the break made us. Uh, some uh, it was it was nice to that he scored just before the the halftime. So after <clears throat> the the locker room at the halftime was really calm as well, but uh, everybody focused on their job and what they need to do, and uh, and after the. Uh, after the game, it was, of course, a big party and uh, everybody happy. And is that, again, from my experiences in France, there's been a lot of emotion and getting pumped up before a game traditionally. Is this maybe an indication of how calm you are because the preparation is so good? You're so well organized, you know your roles, you know how effective you can be and you work so well together. Is that maybe something that's a little bit different with this French team? Yes, maybe we're working on that because... Like Fabian said, we are Latin. We uh, we like to uh, to cry before game or stuff like this. But we uh, on on that kind of game, I think it's important to uh, to work to become and uh, not to um, to get our oh, emotion uh, coming over the the rugby. So that what we uh, we were saying. We when we when we work during all the week, we work as well to to prepare our emotion to be to be ready on on the Saturday game. And uh, and of course, I think. Maybe it's different with uh, with this team because there is really, as I say, an organization, and uh, and you can see it because when the player change, the team result keeps the same. So uh, in fact, what is really important in the team is all the organization, all the week we do before the game. So tell, you you mentioned Gail Ficou and Antoine Dupont stuff as for the players, but you also mentioned the organization. For me, there's a guy that is not really spoken about at all in the UK, at least, but I know he is in France. Fabien Galtier is definitely a strategic genius. I had him as a coach, but he doesn't have the human connections that certain guys have got in this team. And there's one guy that definitely does is William Salvat. He was renowned for that as a player. La Buche, that's, that's what he did at Toulouse. And I, I saw a couple of videos and stuff, and I'm not surprised. He, I think he's got a very, very tight relationship with all the boys inside the group, and especially with the forwards. Could you just tell us a bit more about I don't know a bit like his his human side, you know, his sort of his his heart connection with the boys, because that, that's something that really transpires within the team. Yes, of course, he's uh, someone really close from the players. Um, they like, for example, to have a drinks with, uh, with us after the game because it's important for uh, for him to to link a bit staff and and players as well. And um, I think what is the, the most important is that for for my uh, speaking from my experience after every game. I take half an hour or an hour with him, speaking about the game, looking at the game with a video. And he's telling me, like, this you did it, but uh, this is not acceptable. But this is, oh, this is awesome. This is great. In fact, he tells me the truth. And this is the most important when you're a coach to, to tell to, to the players uh, the reality and to say when it's bad, to say when it's good, to, to say everything to him. And uh, that's what he's doing with me. So, uh, so this is great. After, of course, when he speaks in the, in the locker room, William Servat is was an, an amazing player, a French rugby player. He uh, he loved France and uh, French rugby more than I think anybody. So when you speak in the locker room or at training, you you you, you automatically listen listen to him. And that relationship with the coach is really interesting because Benji often talks on here about <clears throat> when he sees you guys out in a bar afterwards, maybe, or at the stadium, he can tell how close you guys are as players. There's a brotherhood there. But the relationship with the coaches, Johnny's been coached by Fabian. We know he's an intense guy. Just give us an indication of how it works with the coaches. Does Fabian sort of set the structure and then let the other coaches kind of interact with you and do their thing? Well, when uh, Fabian arrived at the, um, at the end of the friendship, he, uh, he asked us to train really, really hard on the field. But really, are like we are always uh, training at live, hundred percent for. Well, it's really tough. We can do it for eight weeks for a tournament, but I couldn't do it for, for more. But, but after, for outside the rugby, he gave us us a, a lot as well, and um, so we are really free during a week. In fact, we can bring uh, like some singer or some uh, people to to come and exchange with us to to spend the the, the, the evening with them. Um, if we if we want to to go eat in a restaurant during the week, we would just uh, say uh, Fabien, when the player wants to go to the restaurant, you know. So we are free as well on on um, uh, on the side, and uh, this is as it, when I was speaking change. This is uh, the biggest change, and this linked uh, the staff as well because. Uh, okay, they asked a lot to us, but they give us a lot as well. Before, like 
you if you were having a beer after a game like everybody was all looking at you like uh, well this is not pro this is uh this is not good uh, or now is not the same at all and like, i managed to catch up with sean edwards after the game and he said a little bit as well he doesn't have the control of that but he said you know after the italy game he's like you know it'll be serious it'll be a six-day turnaround they'll probably be in bed by you know 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And he said, you went down in the morning, there was boys still up. It was half four or five. He was down for breakfast, but he was like, it doesn't matter. Like that's what rugby is about. It's the human relationships, the connections, the friendships, the bonds that you build. And if it's really tightly regulated and you can't do anything, you can't perform together. I think that's what everyone sees. And he sees it firsthand, us maybe a little bit further away, but you have such a good time together off the field. Again, that little bit of leeway that Fabian's given you, but you see what the benefit is, the fun you have on the pitch and the performances that you deliver together have been phenomenal. That's why after the Italy game, we, uh, we like to, uh, to we, had, we had a beer uh, together. But of course, and, uh, we, we like to spend time together. You know, when we, when we are in Marcosi even, we, we like to be all together, to, to, to watch a movie on the, on the night, to, to spend uh, yeah, time together. We are happy together. And this is uh, really important. And I was saying in, a, in an interview that uh, the last uh, sequence against Wales, when we defend um, and uh, Piat uh, get the ball, I think you see that the team is linked and, and there is really a friendship uh, between us because otherwise you, we would have uh, lost this game, I think. I, think. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I told the boys that... Uh... Well, I just said hello to you that night, but we didn't really get to chat. But I, I bumped into you guys after the France New Zealand game, and I remember speaking. So I've, I've I played with with Winnie, I played with Gael, I played with a couple of the Tao and whatever. But I also played with Brice Dulin, who wasn't involved that game. And even Brice was telling me, you cannot imagine how how good the vibe is within the camp. And he wasn't even involved in twenty three. You just missed out on the New Zealand game. You could he, he could have normally been quite bitter about it. And even him, who's a very sort of intense and, and jokey guy and think, takes things very, well, he's very, how do you say that? He's got a lot of emotions about him. And he was like, man, you cannot imagine how much these boys love each other. You can't imagine how, how good the vibe is within the team. And I was like, well, if that's the case, then phew, sky's the limit. Because as long as you guys, is there talent in the team? Of course. Is there going to be ups and downs with the team? Of course. Are you closer of winning the World Cup after Saturday? I'm not sure, but that's irrelevant. Exactly like you said, as long as that unit between and that tightness between you is, is genuine, is heartfelt, is proper 1,000%, then you'll just deal with what gets thrown at you week in, week out. The game against Wales was average, but you just had to go for the last three minutes, dig deep into those connections, deliver a performance, win and move on. And that's what's going to happen in the next few months. So no, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think it's, it's for me, it's the number one um asset of the French name of, of the moment is how much you guys care about each other and care about that jersey and please hold on tight to that because that's 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 the main asset that you've got for the future and Johnny mentioned his flight back with Sean Edwards he could understand about half of what Sean was saying I think so <laughs> just give us an indication because he gets a lot of attention over here obviously in the UK Sean Edwards and the job he's done but try and put into words as someone who's in that camp the effect that he's had and about his French as well. It's coming along. Well, Sean, Sean I think uh, it's hard to describe him because uh, I never saw a guy like Sean. Sean is uh, incredible. Uh, when he arrived, he, he really brought us character to the team, you know, to the defense. Um, like when he do a video, you know, it's really short video because he, he didn't like video when he was player. So he said, I will never do a video more than two minutes. So when you go to the uh, to present some uh, some clips, is uh, always really short. Uh, like say suffocate, we need to suffocate adversary, and that's it. <laughs> no no more words, and just showing the clips, uh, doing some um, some tackle exercise. Well, honestly, it's really hard because we we don't see him a lot, but when we see him, we we we, we love him. <laughs> and is it true? Part of the reason you love him is because he gives a bottle of Dom Perignon to his defender of the day. Is that right? <laughs> and who Dom, won it on Saturday? Dom Perignon is only for big game. Eh? It was a big uh, game on Saturday. Did you get it? Did you get it? No, no, no. We uh, after England we didn't get it. He would give us give it oh. to us. I think the uh, next time. But he's not uh, always uh, the guy who made the most tackle or something like this. Because uh, for the All Black game, for example. Uh, 
guess who get the uh, get the bottle of Dom Perignon? Fabien Penot. <laughs> No. Benji, did he ever win defender Why? of the day at Claremont? Because, he, no, because he came no up and made that world. he made that read off turnover defence in New Zealand's 22 and came up and made that intercept. That was pretty magical. Mate, yeah, no, no. mate he, only, he only did that because he doesn't want to tackle. So that's why he went straight <laughs> for the ball for the intercept. He's really, really quick because he's really, really, really scared. That's, that's the main reason. Greg, when, when he gave that award to Damien Penner, did you say, I hit about 50 defensive rooks today and you've given it to <laughs> Damien? No, no, no. You know, Sean, I will never go against him eh? because uh, <laughs> he likes to, on the morning, go to to do this boxing uh, exercise as well. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't say anything. Awesome. Mate, looking back at that game, you mentioned it there, the England game. Did it pan out tactically how you thought exactly or were you surprised at all? Well, we, we knew that if we were really connected in the, in the middle of the game, uh, in the middle of the of the defense, we would not uh, be uh, worried. Well, worried. We we never know. But in fact, the the, the key was to to keep Marcus Smith uh, calm because uh, we know that he gave a really good step and uh, he could uh, he could break uh, easily. So we wanted to be compact. Not to be too many in the works because, uh, like, one tackler and plus one, and uh, to be really good on the escort uh, as well, which was uh, the key of the game, I think. Uh, and um, and I think we were quite good on the on the escort, you know, protecting the 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 kick receiver. And just talking about the tournament as a whole, obviously a grand slam, huge celebrations, everyone's happy. You can't wipe the smile off Benji's face. You look delighted, thrilled. But there was pressure, wasn't there? Because going into the tournament, everyone was talking you up. There's this favourites tag, which France perhaps haven't had in recent years. So was that a big step to sort of prove that you can handle that favourites tag and also play some of the rugby you've played, which has been a joy to watch? No, it's a big satisfaction for us to to win the, the tournament. Uh, that we started as a favorite, but in in our head when we started the, uh, the tournament, we were not thinking about that because the last two uh, tournament, like we we did wonderful tournament, we did great tournament of two years ago and last year, and we ended up uh, losing against Wales. Who I think uh, nobody was thought Wales would win uh, last tournament. We know that all the British team. When a uh, Six Nation arrives, uh, they get uh, they change. It's not the same team. They are they have more energy. They are better. Everything is uh, is huge. The atmosphere is huge in in Britain, Great Britain. So we know that we need to be serious game after game. Uh, even Italy game uh, so for the last two years, we we lost uh, the tournament on the Italy game. In fact, because. Um, so we had one uh, one focus was to to arrive at the end of the tournament and uh, to be uh, as you say about the carte main, you know, uh, to get the to be in on the, on the last game, you know, that we this we decide on the last game and uh, we did that and um, and after like everything was uh, <clears throat> we won the game and that's it and and the grand slam was there. And I met another guy I wanted to ask you about, Thibaut Giroud. So we've had him on the podcast as well. He's had a massive pact on the sort of performance side, on the physical side of your game. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about Thibaut? Because um, he's a tremendous guy. Yeah, and I think he's, we were speaking of William, you know, and Thibaut is really close as well from the players. And uh, I think everybody, every single player like Thibaut. And, uh, you know, what he's doing on the, on the field is... Um, really good for the players we is really with uh he like to to talk to us to to ask us how we how we feel how we um are we think uh, we if you do that uh as a training uh do you think it's okay for you like he exchanged a lot with us so uh we we play the game so we we tell him with honesty uh what we think we're not looking to do uh the, the less the less and less we we want to do the good uh, good amount of training, and um, and after outside the pitch as well, um, he's always there to have, to have a beer after the game with us. Um, like there is is part of as well to, to to link a bit the staff and the and, and the player is a a, um, a big asset for the for the staff and the team. Are we spoken about the connection with the coaches there? 
Benji spent quite a lot of time in recent weeks talking about the connection between the players and the fans and the amateur clubs as well. We see there's a bit of attention on the the names of the 2000 clubs on the, the shirt. Is that something that has almost been a conscious decision from the FFR and you guys as players? And have you sort of felt that in terms of you obviously came into the side in 2019, you've been part of this journey. Has there been a conscious attempt to sort of re-engage with those clubs and, and the fans and sort of get that mood building towards the, the World Cup, obviously, eventually next year? Well, the, in fact, this uh, on the number, you have all the club uh, name, as you said. It was for one game. It was supposed to be for one game. And we, the players, asked to 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 keep it on the on the jersey for all the other game because for us, it's important, I think. In the team, we have a, we are a lot of players who came from uh, small clubs, uh, for example, I, I played Federal Luin before going to to Top Cartel. So, so I know uh, I know really uh, the, what the, the how important these little clubs are. And uh, it was as well like um, saying last year they couldn't play with COVID. So don't worry, you you with us and uh, you will play. Uh, in fact, uh, every game with uh, with us. And this was a bit the the, the message we wanted to to send to them. And you mentioned you know well that journey. Just give us an insight into your journey because it was a rapid rise, wasn't it? You were playing in, in Federal Alone, like you said, and then a couple of years later, you're playing for the France national side. So talk us through your journey. Everything has been so, so quick for for me. Um, but quick, but I had every step, you know. I didn't miss one step because I started Osh. Uh, did all my uh, under 18, uh, under 17, under 17, under 18, to the the B team. Um, after to the first team, then the first team I went to to La Rochelle, uh, starting uh, with uh, the academy. I did six months with the academy. After Patrice Colazo made me play my, my first game, and um, after this uh, this season, Patrice left. I started back with uh, the academy after Garba and Greg uh, gave me uh, some minutes. And uh, in uh, January, I was with the French team. So, <laughs> in fact, everything has been so, so quick for me. But I had uh, all the steps. And, um, and I had, uh, I had uh, as well this, um, this, um, this tournament, the World Cup, where, where I discovered all the, the French team I was, was working because for me, I would have never thought to be the, in, a, in a French team for one day, you know, and uh, everything has been so quick for me. So, but, but like I, I was saying, that there were all the steps and um, I know where, where I'm coming from. I always have my, my friend who, on the phone who, who, uh, who keep me, uh, my, who keep my, uh, my foot on the ground. <coughs> so, um, so everything okay. I mean, I think people forget you're, you're only 24. I yeah. think you're a young guy. Like it's crazy how quickly it's come, but you still hopefully got another 10 years potentially on the international scene, which is incredible. Um, I don't know how you're going to do it the way you put your body about it. So good <laughs> luck. Um, but tell me a little bit about, again, family. So obviously I know your brother, Scott, as well, who's based in Scotland. I'm still trying to persuade him to pick up a phone to Gregor Townsend and see if he can <laughs> qualify and get a game for us. He plays for Stuart's Melville, but... A little bit about your family background, where your parents are both from, um, links, like there's photos of you going around. Antoine in the past has shown me photos of you in a kilt as a young kid. I know you regret not playing for Scotland, but you're doing okay with France. <laughs> but can you give us a little bit of the background of your family, where everyone was brought up, the time you spent in Scotland as well, um, your brother, everything. Give us a rundown. You made the well, right choice, Greg. No, no yeah, beers after the game. You, you've you've done well. You've done well. <laughs> if I go really precise, it's going to take me an hour, but I'm going to do a quick overall because... Well, my my grandfather was born in uh, Dublin, so uh, on the on my father's side, was born on Dublin. Went to Scotland when he was two. Um, met my uh, my Danish grandmother over there, and uh, he was in the army. So after he went uh, in the in the Commonwealth a bit. So my father was born in Kenya. Uh, started rugby in South Africa at the school. Trying to uh, to do some bad stuff on the on the week to to be kept uh, in the interna on the weekend to go and do rugby on the beach, and uh, after he went back to to Stirling in Scotland where he, he keep uh, playing at uni and everything, and uh, and one day he met my mother in Rome, my mother who uh, was uh, Italian uh, grandparents and uh, 
who, uh, who was born in uh, in uh, in the Gers in France, and um, after well they met, and uh, my mom said, okay, let's go to Scotland. And uh, my dad said, "No way! Between Scotland and southwest of France, we're going <laughs> southwest." So, so they they ended up uh, in the in the southwest of France, and um, and you know when you when you're southwest of France with a, a father playing rugby, you automatically automatically go to rugby when you when you start uh, a sports when you're young. So I started rugby over there, and um, I met some incredible uh, guys, friends. Like uh, Antoine Dupont, like Anthony Jolon, but like Pierre Bourgarit, like Nicolas Corato who is in Po, like Paul Grau who is in Age, and uh, uh, like Paul Pimienta playing. I could tell you like numbers and numbers of players who are playing Pro D2 or Top 14 because when the Gers is really uh, a territory of rugby, and uh, I like to say when you start rugby in the Gers, they don't teach you how to do a pass or how to kick in the ball. They teach you how to respect uh, your, the jersey, how to, to to respect the values of rugby. And this is the most important for me. And, and mate, you mentioned a couple of those guys, but that must be incredibly special to have started rugby at Osh with Antoine and Anthony and now to be have done the full journey, be different clubs, but to be with them in the national team, to be winning Grand Slams for France with your childhood teammates. I mean, you could write a book about that. That does not. That doesn't happen anywhere. That must be incredible for you guys as friends. See, I, I need more weeks to to realize what we did. But of 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 course, like we we are we are living a dream. Like to 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 be with the French team is is, is a dream, and to live the dream with uh, my my best friend, like is, there is no words to put on that. This is uh, see what every rugby rugby players are, are looking. And just a word on Antoine Dupont. Obviously, everyone talks about him. Europe for player of the tournament alongside him, as well as well as Josh van der Fleer. Um, have you had a word with him? Because he's won every award going, won this award a couple of years back. Have you said, Antoine, this is mine? No, I said, no, see, I'm not texting him. We're not uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but just a, a, a word on that. I would have loved to see uh, Cyril Bay or Paul Willem say in the, yes. in the list because they did an amazing job. They are not so much in the in the in the uh, in the bright, but they are so important for the team. And uh, I would have loved to see uh, a prop, you know, being uh, being player of the tournament like Cyril because it's a position that we don't talk about. And uh, I think they are the, the two most important players in the team. Trust me, mate. I speak about it mm -hmm. every single week. And I bang on about it at anybody who's who's happy to listen to me about it. Seilba <laughs> is only the player with the most offloads in the whole Six Nations. Seilba <laughs> is only, you know, when Fabien Galtier says after after the Scotland game, why did he have a good game? Oh, it's fantastic because he, he scrimmages well. But on top of that, he's got a good connection with Anton Dupont. Since when is it important for your loose cell props to have a good connection with your number nine? You know, that's how influential he is. It's because 50% of the slow, slow ball goes through him. No, no, mate, trust me. If, if there's one guy who bangs on about him, it's, it's me and it's Johnny and it's Tim. Uh, we, we, we love those boys. But it's, it's more the... I, I was, I, I'm always super impressed with the guys who do the hard graft, but who are the sort of the engine of a, of a team. And the guys that you mentioned definitely, definitely got that about them. But... Um, I think it's 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 down to you boys to to keep on promoting them as long as you guys know who cares about what the press says. Oh, you know? exactly. Stick 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 to what you guys love. And that's leadership there. You I asked you about the the player of the tournament award and you nominate two other players. So there you go. That's <laughs> that's, that's leadership for you. But give us a word on Antoine Dupont's leadership because obviously he stepped up to the captaincy role. Um how does he lead? Does he lead by example? Does he do a lot of talking? What kind of character is he within the group? And we spent a bit of time talking about it. So tell us you gave him some stick for that yellow dressing gown in GQ. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Antoine is um, he's a really calm guy, you know, and he's this kind of leader who, uh, when he talk, all the, the local, like, uh, it's silence in the local, everybody listen to him. And uh, when he, he, he quite knows rugby as well, quite well. <laughs> so when he talk about rugby, yeah, everybody listen. But after he's a, a, a captain who, who, who listen a lot to uh, to the group, you know, to uh, to what the the player says, 
And uh, he will not hesitate like one second to go and see the staff and say, well, the group don't want that, we want that, I want that. And this is important as well for uh, for a leader to to assume uh, his role. And he did it really well during the, the tournament. And uh, yeah, what could I tell is every time like you say this is too much for him, I'm sure it's too much for him. And every time like he, he looks so, so, so easy, so, uh, so calm and so like, it's nothing. You say that, but then when um, when the Charles Olivon unfortunately got injured, and Anthony Jolon did a great job in Australia, um, when when obviously we were speaking about the captaincy, I was one of the guys who was saying, "Mate, he's got enough light on him. It doesn't change anything. The fact that he's captain doesn't change anything to his leadership. I'm sure he's number nine, so he's really influential. And number nine is always there to tell you what to do and how to do things. So I'm not sure it's changed anything. And I was thinking. It's about time, you know, leave him off a little bit. Let him let him breathe. But on top of that, they added, were, did you share that, that, that idea or were you thinking, man, he's, he can take on anything, so he might as well be captain? No, he can take everything. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, know, I know him like, since for ages now. And I know that every time like uh, he doesn't have pressure or, or at least he doesn't show us the pressure. And this is the most important because you can take the pressure, but you need to feel... Uh, happy with it or I don't know for, for the group for the for the other guys counting on you uh, you need to to feel to feel good and he's always feeling good he's always happy well yeah he likes to uh, to always uh, rally, 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 but, uh, Moan. It, yeah <laughs> when he's moaning he's, he's okay <clears throat> again I played with him at cast and I was like he's always been unflappable and effortless so I thought give him the captaincy like it, it won't it won't come down to him at all but you avoided Tim's question. Please tell me that the effort to get that yellow dressing gown, he got some stick from you, his childhood mates, and he got some stick as well from his teammates. Uh, of course, we told him like uh, we need to uh, to tell him when he, when he, <laughs> when you do some great photo. But you know, this is uh, what I like with uh, this kind of JQ uh, magazine. He did like, that. Finally, we have uh, a French rugby man who is a is a it's star. Amazing. You know. Who is a star? And uh, who, uh, if you ask now in the street to men who don't watch rugby, you say Antoine Dupont he is going to know the guy. And I think French rugby missed uh, this kind of uh, rugby player for for a long time. And uh, you know, you, you had the you had the Chabal, you had the, the guys like this. But for ages, we didn't have the superstar like him. You know, the one who all the French people know, and we finally have it. So. Of course, you need to be careful to the photo he's doing, but it's great to see him like doing uh, this kind of magazine and uh, being able to be to be the star he is. Quite right. And did did he have a word with Antoine afterwards and say, "I'm winning player of the tournament"? When I do, give me GQ's number. I wear a pink dressing gown. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, you no, want no. for that? I, I say I, I'm not. I don't like the photo, and uh, I think uh, I would. Uh, pink is uh, is too bright for me. <laughs> Um, and do personal, on a serious note, do personal accolades mean anything to you? It sounds like they don't really. It sounds like it's all about the team and the the environment and the culture. And whether you win this, Antoine wins it, Josh Van der Fleer wins it, you don't really care. Honestly, I don't care. Uh, what, I wanted a, a trophy, a collective trophy. Um, of course, I'll be happy if I win uh, the, the this, this this award because it's uh, it's always grateful for. It's always nice to to get a award like this, but. I'm not. I'm not looking for individual uh, trophy, and I want uh, plenty of trophy, but collective trophy. And I had my first trophy in my career, so I'm so happy with that. I don't care about the rest yet. That's awesome, mate. Honestly, so cool. It's so cool to do, see you doing so well and playing so well. Um, and I'm sure as well too. Again, it was so close last year as well with La Rochelle. You've got some important games coming up to get back up the table, so I'm sure there's a possibility of extra silverware in both competitions. There as well but thank you so much for coming on and speaking to us mate it's been awesome oh, thanks to you cheers greg congratulations thanks thanks cheers merci greg beaucoup. merci à très vite allez ciao great to hear straight from the horse's mouth and also fascinated listening to that list of countries from his family Amazing. sounds like he could have played for any of the six nations countries apart from england or even more in kenya or south africa or yeah wherever. yeah no mate he's super down to earth Super chilled, I think, is a straight reflection of what he does on the pitch when he's just a force of nature, but also quite a very genuinely giving and hardworking animal. 
Um, and you can it, that just sort of sweats out of him. So no, mate, we're we're lucky. We're lucky to have found such a such a such a number eight to pick up from probably from the legacy of uh, Louis Picamol and all those guys. But take just take it to another dimension. Uh, he's I don't know if he's going to win player of six nations, but bloody hell, he's not going to be really far. Whoever gets it, <laughs> you know, fair play. I mean, that's the thing we like we mentioned. He's twenty four. No, it's like, crazy. It is absolutely freakish what he's churning out. The amount of time he's had in pro rugby, what he's bringing to the party naturally is unbelievable. Like, there's not many people that have done that over 10 years. The quality that he's churning, he's, he's probably the form eight on the planet at the minute, mm. age 24. So I mean, he's a lovely boy. His, his family are awesome as well. Like you mentioned, he could have played for any country and he would have been sensational for every single one. Um, but just so good to hear from him. And again, hear how much fun they're having. I think that's the bit that I'm getting is how much fun they have off the field, the time they're having together. And he said it like he's living a dream. So, so good to have him on and an absolute legend. Right. It might seem like an obvious one from the outside, but it's about time we did our meter moment of the week. So are we right, Benji? What is it? Well, you could have picked anything that happened in France, France, England. It could have been any performance. But I think you know where I'm going. Ange, Ange Capuazzo, you know, going through six or seven Welsh defenders, 78th minute and 50 seconds, uh, feeding off inside Padovani, who actually, if you look at it, got pushed by a Welsh guy into support where he should have been. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pick that one up for one hell of a victory. I mean, I think, listen, Italy have been the talk of the Six Nations for the last few months. They haven't won a game since 2015. It's a shambles. Nothing's going right. On the 20s, win three consecutive games in Six Nations, which is unheard of, um, with um, with you know generations of guys who are who are absolutely out there. And against Wales or against Scotland, they played well, but they got just outperformed by a team that just was a little bit too much for them. And against Wales, they won the game by playing. They defended like animals. They were absolutely everywhere, but they played. They chucked the ball around. They put some tempo. Garbisi was was doing really well. Padovani is a threat. Brex and Marine, I think, in the center is actually really good players. And they played. Uh, I can't remember what the name of their number six. Petticelli, I think it was something like that. Petticelli, really good player. Uh, Petinelli. And, then, and, and they, they did just super well. Fis, um, Fischetti, the loose head prop. He was running around Man, like, 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 like Amish Watson. <laughs> <laughs> like that really is how, how good he is. So no, no, they, they won by playing. They won with heart. They won with talent. And that last counter attack is just breathtakingly incredible uh, to finish off on a high. And then again, Garbisi kicking that that transformation and falling over. The general happiness and proud uh, that they've got. I don't think they're out of trouble yet. They still have a lot of improvement to be made, made but... They've, they 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 play with with their soles in in their boots and and they did really really well. So meter of the moment is obviously Italy beating Wales in Principality Stadium at the last minute with Ange Capuzzo's um, counter attack that was just lightning incredibly good. Fair play to the squadra azzurra. I'll add to that a bit that I thought was an even nicer touch was Josh Adams giving his man of the match medal. Um, so the moment I absolutely agree, but the fact that he was able to recognize that moment individually for his opposite man or for the fullback um, and for Italian rugby as a whole, like you mentioned, where they're going to the 20s, beating England, beating Scotland. I mean, some of the performances have been first draw. Um, absolutely. Italy beating Wales for the first time. And it means that I'm no longer part of the last side to lose to Italy. So I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted. So well done, Italy. And long may it continue. It's great for the tournament. There we go. That was Benji and Johnny's Meter moment of the week. And Meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full-price item with the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout as well. Briefly, Johnny, you were in Dublin. We should have a brief word on that game. Do we have to? Scotland. <laughs> well, actually, forget the game. Ireland with a better side. But what's going on with Scotland? Oh, look, Ireland as well. It's the first time they had a chance to win silverware in front of their own fans in something like 10 years. They've won and picked up trophies in different parts of the world in different stadiums. So it was important for them. Um, but Scotland on the field were very, very poor. Um, and obviously what's come out from what happened the weekend before was also poor. But I, I think to compare and contrast it to the French side, 
the French side are allowed to do what they want. They're grown ups, um, and there's obviously a sort of it just doesn't look good. It's childish back and forth and control and pushing back and people having to release statements to explain what's happened. And it just looks bad. It just looks bad for Scottish rugby. Um, and so it's not enjoyable and it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. So look, the performance was bad. Um, whatever's gone off, gone on off the pitch is bad as well. And they need to sort it out. Um, I don't know how, I don't know when, but something needs to change. And I don't mean Gregor because he's still the best coach that we've had in the modern era. He's got the best win percentage, but in terms of the environment and how they get on and how they deal with each other, they could learn a few lessons from the French um, and they should probably take notes. Um, but yeah, not good. Some performance wasn't good and the stuff off field is just a little bit embarrassing for everyone. Speaking of win percentages, that is the Six Nations done and dusted. So let's quickly find out your win percentages in terms of the match pint predictor, the Guinness match pint predictor. <laughs> Um, Benji, I reckon you were just trying to redress the balance a little bit. You know, France doing so well. You thought I can't, I can't be doing well in the in the match point predictor league as well. But I'm just below Jim Hamilton, mate. This, this, it's as fair as Jake Noel not getting a card <laughs> for that high high challenge. It was a clear mistake. It was a clear mistake when I put Italy beating England by 35 points in round two. I think it was my big fat fingers cost me cost me a couple of. I did still made some mistakes, but my big fat fingers cost me cost me that. Um, and I'll take it on the chin. And Johnny fourth in the Guinness Legends League, respectable, respectable, Scotland. but no, no anyways, <laughs> at fourth. I think every finish fourth pretty much every year. So I'll take it. Um, I know my place, and fourth sounds about right. Oh, there we go. There you go. That is the Guinness match pint predictor and the Six Nations done and dusted for this year. And don't forget, you can still claim your pints of Guinness this week too. And just a quick one before we go as well, Johnny. I know anyone watching the Six Nations coverage on ITV at the weekend may have seen the news about Federico Martin Aramburu. Yeah. And I know you both knew him. But I know, Johnny, you were commentating on the game but only heard the news the morning of the game it was obviously a difficult time, but a real character and someone who you knew very well and such sad news. Um, just a wonderful human being um, and truly horrific circumstances and what happened. Um, you could never excuse, but just a quick word on Fede. Like Fede and I played together two years at Glasgow Warriors, didn't speak a word of English. So we'd sit on the bus together and that's how I try and practice my French. We kind of planted this seed in my mind to try and get to France and he was a big part of inspiring me to try and get over here um, he was the first person that I drove to see when I arrived in Montpellier I drove six and a half hours over to Beers to stay with him spend time with him and his wife Maria and their children um, and genuinely one of the nicest people that I've come across in rugby um, and I know a lot of lip services paid to people um, when we were paying our respects but Fede genuinely could not have been a better bloke um, a better teammate, a better man, a better husband and father, um, kind, generous, warm, upbeat, everything that you'd want in a friend and everything you'd want in a teammate. So I was incredi incredibly proud, proud to have played with him, but even more so to have had him as a, a friend and known him. Um, and so I think from from all of his teams, like his team in Buenos Aires, Eurits, Perpignan, Dax, Glasgow Warriors and the Pumas, um, we've all been extremely lucky to have been part of his journey. Um, and now just all of our love goes to Maria and their three children in Biritz um, during an incredibly difficult time, but a wonderful man taken far too soon. And a hugely difficult day for Johnny, obviously on Saturday, you, you knew him as well, Benji, just desperately sad news and just, just tragic. What more can you say? Yeah, it's one of those tr tragic, horrendous uh, moments that life just throws at you. Um, that you you want to hide away from 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 the reality of how you know sudden death can cause so much pain, especially with when when it's in a situation that we you know basically it was after a long line out in Paris in a place that that we've we've all been to for the rugby lovers in, in France uh, so many times. Um, Dimitri Ashvili, who commentates for the French team, knew him really well from Beritz and was receiving videos and pictures of him during the night of them having fun can't wait to see you tomorrow and the next morning you wake up and and there's been this this tragic incident the only thing you can you can say is is life is short cherish the people that you love and that 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 you want near 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 you 
um, that he will not be forgotten because like like Johnny said, when, when you're that kind and genuine and when you're so positive and upbeat, you feed off people. And I think he gave a lot of light and a lot of hope to a lot of people and a lot of smiles and he will not be forgotten. And, and we can only want him to, to rest in peace and, and that he, he will stay with us. But it's, it's one of those horrendously tragic moments where life can be unfair, but all we can do is um, keep it in our hearts and, and live life for him, through him. And until we, we go to. Well said both of you. And, um- Johnny, he'd have loved to see him France win the Grand Slam, wouldn't he, on Saturday? A guy who settled in France and and clearly loves France. That's it. A French citizen, uh, a Frenchman, um, and a massive part of French rugby teams. He's won top 14 twice, close mates with everyone at Biritz. That's his social circle today. Those are all of his closest friends. Um, so they, like everyone, will be hurting massively. And that was it. That's what he was there for. He was there to watch rugby with friends, have a beer, doing something that we all love and that was his life um so incredibly sad but thinking of him his wife maria and the three children absolutely thanks johnny thanks benji a big thanks to all you guys for listening a massive thanks and congratulations to greg aldrich for joining us today and winning france's 10th six nations grand slam make sure you hit subscribe leave us a nice review if you can as well check us out on rugby pass and on youtube and we will be back with another episode next week Au revoir, guys. Cheers. Cheers, boys.